Welcome coming down to earth, an online conflict transformation summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. I am really thrilled to have today with me Anna Rhodes. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Anna, you are an organizational consultant, a trainer, a therapist. You coach executives and mentor many different people. You've been involved, you've been working as a trainer and facilitator for the last 15 years, working with individuals, with groups, with networks. I know you a bit because you worked with the Findor Neco Village in Scotland for in, in many different roles. You've been working with networks and spaces of change with people from all over the world. I'm really, really happy to have the opportunity to have this conversation with you and share some of your perspectives on this topic with the audience, with the, the with our listeners. So they, thank you for thank accepting you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's very, I love being part of uh, networks my whole life. I've been part of networks. I feel very honest. Yeah, so Perhaps that's that's the the best way to start. You've been you've been on a on a journey yourself, uh, a very interesting um, journey, moving through different spaces of change, where people try to collaborate to bring um, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible into life. How come how come it's so difficult for us human beings coming to these spaces of working together and just not being able to deal with tensions and conflicts in a way that could be more healthy and regenerative. What is getting us stuck? What's what's going on? What have you been observing about this in your journey? It's a great question. It's such a, I mean, it's it's a question that can be, I think, answered through so many different perspectives. And I just want to say, before I say anything, that... Um, um, I would invite everyone that is listening, that it's part of this event, to really think about this question also personally, not just globally. Uh, what are the things? Why do I continue behaving in such a warlike manner, in such a against the other manner, right? Why do I continue to see conflict as a means of winning? Right? Why do I still continue to see myself either as a winner or a loser? And I think that's one of the main things I want to, I want to, how I want to respond to that question in my journey of life. I left home when I was 17 years old. I went to live in the Finhon Foundation, which is an, an eco village and a spiritual community. And I, I arrived there as a gardener. I became a gardener for many years. And then I ended up being the manager of a spiritual and personal development and then the director. How is that possible? From <laughs> a garden into a director, right? And But especially I want to say that I want to talk about my experience when I arrived there because I came from a place of feeling like a loser in my life, right? I felt like I had to fight to win something. So I was very good at conflict, at war. I was good at being angry. I was good at finding somebody that I could accuse, right? I spent a lot of years accusing my family and my parents of being my enemies. And when, when I was tired, <clears throat> when I got tired of that story, then I accused somebody else. And then I found somebody else. So I think that's one of the things I want to say. I want to say, um, we have a history of winning or lo and losing. We have we have been taught the narrative of our history of many nations, the history of many nations, as a story and a narrative of, of winning and losing. It's a very particular narrative that says there are winners and there are losers. If you win, you are successful and you are the queen and the king of the territory. And if you lose, you are the servants of the territory. 
So we have very a very par- particular narrative around conflict. And so it's very difficult to break this narrative. And this is a narrative that is based on uh, rank, privilege, and power. And it's based on those that have more rank and more power are the successful ones, right? And those of us that happen to be in a tribe or in a community or in a a space or come from a story of less privilege and less power are meant to be losers. (laughs) So I want to say that this is one of the main things why it's so difficult to see conflict in a different way from a... From a, from a quantum physics perspective, from a more cosmic prospect, perspective, cosmic, it's a big bang. Uh, sorry, conflict is a big bang. It's a process of pressure. From, a, from an evolutionary perspective, conflict is not about winning or losing. It's about evolution. Pressure happens different points of view come together externally, different political points of view, different relational points of view, different ways of being come together and they encounter each other and they arrive to a place of potential understanding. They come to understand each other. And and then conflict happens, why, why? Because we are trying to understand, we are trying, to, we are trying to get to know each other. We are trying to understand each other's story, each other's heritage, each other's ways, right? And why? So that we can find a way to collaborate in terms of resolution, in terms of a new potential movement of understanding each other. That's another narrative where conflict. It's only a point of pressure, like an acupuncture point, right? A point of pressure that looks for conscious evolution. It's supporting conscious evolution, like love. Love is the same. When you fall in love, you want to get, you you feel pressure. You feel the pressure to go towards the other, right? And when you feel conflict, you feel pressure sometimes to um, defend yourself, sometimes to run, (laughs) sometimes to uh, go against, go towards the other. And uh, it's like a place of, it's an encounter, but it feels like an impossible situation. Sometimes... Uh, sometimes conflicts where are very, when they are very political and very polarized and very uh, polarized power positions, they feel like impossible situations. And then it's much easier to go into the old narrative, the old narrative where there has to be a winner and there has to be a loser. And, um, and it's a narrative of abuse of power where abuse of power and abuse of privilege, it's the sword with which you fight. And it's a narrative of war. So this is a very complex thing. And maybe I say one more thing about this narrative around power. Uh, Power and and privilege is very interesting. So we, so privilege, Privilege, we it's it's privilege is social, political, ethnic, due to your religion, your gender, right? All these all these global privileges that we accumulate or that you feel you have or you feel you don't have. So many global privileges. And then we have contextual privileges, structural privilege that relate to the context how long you've been in that community, um, how long you've been in that organization, right? And then we have psychological privileges. We have have the privilege 
of feeling good about ourselves, of feeling comfortable in our own skin, of feeling that we more or less like ourselves, right? Those are privileges, psychological privileges. And then we also have this, this deep feeling, this essential feeling of no matter what, you have a right to be on planet Earth. You have a place in the, in the, in the great scheme of things, right? You matter. That's a very deep, essential sense of belonging, like your, your untouchable power. Nobody can kill that power, right? We are born with the right to exist in this world, to be part of nature. So in moments of conflict, how we use privilege, if we can change the narrative of how we use power and privilege, meaning outer privileges, your psychology, your psychological presence or psychological privilege and your feeling of belonging, your deepest sense of power of yourself. If we can change that narrative, then we have an opportunity to change how do we relate to conflict. It's one of the most important narratives of conflict. Well, thank you so much for that time. I was thinking, I was, I was hearing you and thinking how interesting the what you're saying is in the sense that most most of us are not really <coughs> aware of of the rank we have, the privileges, and it takes a lot of work on self observation and engaging in in relationship with others to to be able to to see that. And what I'm hearing also is, is not only that we need to be more aware so that we can be more responsible in the way we, we relate with others while having rank and privileges in certain situations and being not privileged in others, because that's the thing. We start to discover that actually everybody has, depending on the context, more rank than you or in certain privileges in other contexts uh, it changes but th that also tells me that many people who might be feeling uh, powerless actually they are not aware of certain places of power that they inhabit them or that they inhabit because of the tendency to to not because not being aware and the tendency maybe to portray themselves as powerless and low rank and yeah, it reminds me one one conversation uh, some years ago on a group where where there was a big discussion. It, it was a um, it was a big discussion around uh, rank between people from different countries, and then there was like two people saying that they were one man and one woman saying they were with the ones with less rank. Uh, they were always uh, not privileged and suffering a lot of, of abuses because of that. And in a certain moment, the, the man starts to say a lot of things and the woman gives two steps to the side and says, like, you, are, you have a lot of what you're saying. You are not privileged. You have, just because you are a man, you have a lot of privileges. And it was a big shock for, for him to just have someone who was on his side suddenly saying, you have much more privileges than me just because you are a man. That's right. That's right. I think what you are saying is very important. Power, rank. Right? Uh, rank is the sum of your privileges, right? Rank is about the sum of your privileges in the different levels, psychologically, globally, contextually. You know, and this feeling of deep belonging, which you could say your deepest spiritual connection to life, right? So it's very fluid. It's all, it, it moves, it changes depending on the times, the context. It's all very fluid. But in moments of conflict, if we are not aware of how we use our powers, right? Mm -hmm. Then this old story of winning or losing gets very active. When in those moments there is the potential for a new narrative and a new story, which is the story of evolution. Evolution says conflict is only an encounter of diversity that is looking to understand itself. So that's a very new narrative. Mm. We can, 
if we can become more conscious of our powers and our privileges and use them to understand the other, understand the opponents, the very diversity that we are afraid of in moments of conflict, if we are able in those moments to be more fluid with our privileges and share them, if you feel uncomfortable, right, then you feel low rank psychologically in the moment of a conflict, and then somebody else that feels very comfortable in the midst of that conflict in a community meeting, somebody feels very comfortable, that's a high level of rank psychological privilege, right? Feeling very comfortable. But if you are aware of it and you see someone that is very uncomfortable, instead of like not sharing your feeling of comfort in the moment of conflict, conflict looks for evolution, supports evolution. We need it in order to continue to evolve more. We can see it as a place of awareness. You can say to the person, I notice you feel very uncomfortable. Can I do something? It's a very difficult conflict we are having. And I'm interested in you having a place in this conflict. I don't want to be the only one having a place in this conflict. Right? So it's a new story. We can mm -hmm. use co our, our privileges to support encounter, to support the process of meeting each other instead of to divide, to win or lose and recreate what is called the cycle of violence and the same story, a story of war and a story yes. of the division. Uh, well, it's a very powerful story. That yeah, we particularly because maybe there's other there's other ideas or other narratives that inter intertwine and kind of really are deeply embedded with that one. And I'm thinking like, as I hear you, the, the story of separation and another is the story of scarcity. So exactly. maybe you can speak a bit about, a bit more about how those interconnect or build on each other, because obviously that, that makes us even harder for us to get out of that, uh, of that way of seeing and of being in the world. That's right. That we have different narratives that support. Uh, for example, we have a very powerful um, capitalistic narrative, right? That says having more, it's better. The more you have, the more successful you are. So in some ways, the capitalistic narrative comes, it's, very, it's what supports the narrative of, of a scarcity, of feeling like you never have enough. Right? So mm -hmm. if there is a narrative of capitalism and consuming, consuming more, building more, having more, right? Then, of course, it comes with it that I don't have enough yet, that I need more. And in moments of conflict, that narrative is very strong. The feeling that we are not enough, the feeling that um, we want more. We want to live and come out of this conflict having the right to say, I was right. I knew better. I knew more than you, right? So it's very, it, it, it just comes into that place when conflict happens. Conflict is a hotspot, meaning it's an explosion of energy. It's like a big bang where, where, you will notice your, your feeling of being separate highly, the narrative of separation, right? So in the middle of a conflict, you will notice what you don't have. That's a scarcity, feeling like you have less or you are not enough. You will also notice a lot the feeling of being separate and feeling alone, right? in the middle of a conflict is a huge big bang. So you really feel the split between the parts, the division, feeling not good enough, feeling alone in this world, feeling misunderstood, right? Feeling separate. They all come together, those narratives in the middle of a conflict. But we are split into parts so that we may get to understand more our relationships. Right? That is the different one. That is the narrative of evolution. We feel the division 
so that we will understand more the relationships between the parts, so that we will understand more the whole, feeling again part of a whole. So conflict does two things. It splits you, and then you feel the division and loneliness and alone, and at the same time, it brings you together. It gives you the space to understand the other side and to understand that at one level we are all connected and that if you lose, I lose. That's a new, a new narrative, right? Yeah, it's, it's almost like if, if you haven't had a conflict with, that, with another person yet, it's, be, it's because you haven't met her <laughs> somehow, yeah, right? Because I, mean, I remember very early, in my very early professional uh, life to, to have a conversation, uh, an ongoing conversation with some friends who were my frequent collaborators of saying, we are a great team because we can hold, you know, like difficult things and say difficult things to each other and still be engaged in working together. So it, it, we already felt in those times that we were um, we were moving further in our ability to be to be in relationship and to to work out amazing things together because we were able to be uh, holding that difficult spots and. And touching touching each other in difficult ways, like really pointing the finger at things that maybe cause us pain. That's right. It's, it's the same thing with myself. Over over the years, why do I feel more comfortable with myself? Why? Because I've understood parts of me that were in conflict with with each other. Different parts of how I function, different beliefs different ways of being, I've started to really build relationships internally. And so thanks to the process of feeling a split, I start to feel whole again, right? I say about myself, many times I say, I am broken, but I'm learning to relate my broken parts, right? Many people, come to me saying, Anna, I feel psychotic. I feel like a split between my different parts. And they, and they say to me, what can I do? And I say, well, we can build relationship between your parts. That's a good beginning, a new story, right? So I think that's one of the narratives around that we've been, we've been working with, that uh, conflict divides us. But really, conflict is trying to seek relationships, to seek intimacy, to seek understanding. And um, there is also something that, uh, in terms of why we repeat these processes of, uh, and, and, you know, this concept of power, how do we, how can we share power and privileges in those moments? I think that's very important. Instead of using them for winning or losing, and then we have, um, um, you could say we have a God complex. I'm going to be very ru ruthless about this one. Um, yeah, please do so. Uh, there is also a narrative that I encounter in organizations with myself, with individual clients, with communities. The eco-village of the Finland Foundation, spiritual community and an eco-village. I work with many eco-villages also with businesses, I work from with, with organizations in the ground to very major uh, m names, very major power organizations economically. And there is one thing I encounter everywhere. It's this God complex. It's a narcissistic attitude to our powers and to ourselves, wanting to be the center of the universe. Right? What an incredible, what an incredible tendency we have to want to be at the center of everything. Our organization has to be the best. I have to be the best. I am the one that knows everything around. It's at my service. Nature is at my service. You know, all the resources of nature are at my service. All the, all these 
incredible as a therapist, careful with a God complex. Oh my God, I, you know, I can really support so many people, right? So, and it's complicated because if there is a God complex, there is on the other side a need for a God, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. This is an interesting, and this I find everywhere. So we are looking for someone that can, can point us in the right path around conflict, around depression, around difficulties, around war, somebody that's going to save us. You know, we have so many stories of people that have supported humanity to change, right? So many. We've had so many mini-gods, I call them, mm -hmm. right? We have so many mini-gods, very useful mini-gods. But I think it's it's also a story that creates a god complex, and um, and it divides the feeling of power into in, it, it gives the feeling of power to one single particle, to one individual, one organization, one group. One, oh yes, the ecological the ecological group, the eco villages now know they know best. They are now the ones that are going to save us. Wonderful. If you are not in an eco village, you are, you are a mess. <clears throat> you will not survive. Right? So that is, you see, the God complex moves around. <laughs> it's so, yeah, it's th this, this, this kind of uh, need for people to have models, reference, reference points, which I think often I observe that people fall in the trap of idealization like you know just focusing on the on the positive aspects on the strengths of the on the privileges and the strengths of the of the person or, or of the group or the entity whatever and then there's this kind of strange relationship where also the person or the organization will also try to embody or to make more visible those aspects and what i see and i would like you to comment a bit on is like that actually eventually the dark aspects like the shadow of it is going to <coughs> is going to come come up you know and i'm just thinking like for instance shambhala space which has been a very big influence on different kind of leadership and you know uh, in in the world these days how big a backlash they had just because of the the dark side that emerged because nobody was wanting to see that i mean it was most probably was there all the time it's just that we This, this this ideal idealization, this hope for a, a steady ground for some kind of figure that is godlike, that is guy perfect, uh, let lead us to to false traps of, uh, of of yeah, of what it means to be a leader, of what it means to be yeah, to have the power to 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 give to give you uh, some direction or to help you in some direction. On, on there's all sorts of yeah. things. That's right. That's why I say it's a very dangerous narrative because at one level it's useful to have reference points like Gandhi was a mini god. You could say a reference point that supported mm -hmm. humanity. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, so many. We've needed these reference points, right? But the danger of these reference points is this process of becoming a mini god either as a community, as an organization, as a group, like Shambhala process, but many, many, many systems, right? Or individuals. Mm -hmm. And when you develop this God complex, that is one thing that happens. Power corrupts. Gods have a lot of power because they have the truth and they are such an important reference point and there is so much transference I come to you and I see only the best. And so what happens is that that level of, that level of transference blinds the process of self-feedback and self-observation. And it also kills the feedback loop, right? So it's very important when I work with communities and with organizations of any type, that men, one of the first things I say to them, say, let's talk about your God complex. Let's talk about let's talk about how wonderful, amazing you are, and let's also talk about where are you messing up, and let's talk about your feedback loop. 
who is giving you feedback these days? Do you have feedback? Do you receive feedback? Do you welcome feedback? And in most organizations that have a lot of conflict and that the conflict is in the shadows is because of the feedback loop has disappeared. They no longer welcome feedback either internally, they don't self-reflect, and they don't welcome feedback from the relationship channel and from the context. So it's very important if you are interested in um, negotiating conflict differently to address your narcissistic tendencies of thinking about becoming the best and shining, being a shine and a light for the world because you need feedback in order for your shadow to be worked on. And the feeling of being possessed by power and in some ways your psychology becomes trapped in that feeling of God complexity. And that is a very dangerous process. And I see it a little bit in the spiritual movements sometimes. I see it a little bit in the eco-village movements sometimes. I see it, for example, when I work with big petroleum companies as well. I see it in myself. I see it in my colleagues. It's a huge story. And um, I would say to people, watch out. You need feedback. Without mm. feedback, well, you are dangerous. One thing that perhaps is, is, is a difference, and uh, it's a question to you, I don't know. I, I'm not uh, in, in such a diverse setting as you, you've been, but it's like, it feels to me that you described very well the dynamics in the, in the social change spaces, and I was wondering, like in institutions of like of um, societal power, like you know, uh, organizations, uh, companies, uh, corporations, on oil corporations, other institutions, the kind of characteristics of personal characteristics that lead you to places of power and to have that godlike um, place are actually even more problematic in the sense that they favor traces, human traces that seems to me more sociopathic, like if the less you are empathic or compassionate to others, the more easy it's going to be for you to go up the ladder and to reach places of power. Is that is that what you also observe or you, you have a different look at this? Because mm. sometimes it feels to me like in our society what it means to be successful and and it's kind of uh, problematic these days because most of the role models of figures of power have traces which are actually uh, undermining what the majority of, of, of humans would say is a, is a healthy trace, you know, of feeling compassionate, caring for the, where the others are and if they have what they need and being in relationship. And I see that I see that the dynamics taking place in institutions and different places of power in, within society. Yeah, let me say something about that. So, um, uh, so yes and no. Meaning, um, I don't think that is less dangerous uh, in the eco-village movement than in the political system movement or that in a uh, corporate. I, I think it's equally dangerous. It's just mm -hmm. the level of impact is different. And the place of the impact is different. So, for example, one thing that I'm also very involved with is in political dynamics and political conflicts and facilitating different political processes in, in different places. I have to be careful how, how much I say about that um, in terms of where and, and what. Um, but it's it's just... This process of becoming, this process of this God complex, it's, it's, it happens anywhere, everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's just the impact is different. Your circle of impact is different. And, and there is some things that influence uh, this, this, uh, this process. So one, so this God complex is this ultimate process of when power possesses me 
I am possessed by this monster of power, right? And I am like, I'm like the center of the universe, right? And why does that happen? I mean, it's crazy, right? So it can happen anywhere. I say it again, the impact, where, where the impact is, is different. And the impact is different levels of impact in a political level, it has a major level of impact at a social political level. In my small community, it has a high level of impact within my small community right? It depends on the impact. And there is one thing that is very, so why do we do this? Why does it happen? Right? It's, why? So there is different factors. One is situational, meaning contextual. So the, the influences of the context. So if I have certain influences in one context and other influences in other contexts, that is really going to promote this godlike obsession with myself. So, for example, if I am with a group of colleagues that give me feedback freely, the influence of how I use my power is different. The situation is negotiating the use of my power differently because I have all this feedback. but. If I'm in a context where feedback, contextual feedback is very low, then I'm going to be growing into this process of feeling almighty, all-powerful, all-perfect, okay? So situational is very important. That's why feedback is so important. The other thing that really influences is your natural disposition. Mm, that's more personal. Okay, so my natural disposition, meaning the way I relate to my own power, my own relationship to my rank and my privilege. Uh, do I notice my shadows? Do I not? Am I a person that really needs to feel all the time good about myself? I am the kind of person that likes to be in positions of power and leadership and authority. Or am I the kind of person that prefers to be a little bit in the background, right? That's just your natural disposition and your your process of how do you relate to power and privilege and rank, right? Rank is the, the sum of your privileges. And the third thing is more, uh, is a psychological dynamic. It's like, um, let me see how I, exp how I say that in a simple way. Um, um, uh, yes, so the third thing is like, it's like, um, you know, about sociology and the psychology of society and uh, this process of uh, how certain societies function and roles and the way we relate in, in cultural, psychological spaces in, in the culture. So that's the other thing. The other thing is uh, the roles, the psychology of that group, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, that community that you are a part of, the political, the psychology of the politics of that territory, the psychology of that community, the culture, right? So that also affects a lot. For example, uh, the psychology of many political spaces is a very, very detached psychology, meaning in order to be a political figure, you have no feelings. You can't express your feelings. So of course you are so, so that affects the way you work with power. If you are amongst gestalt therapists, <laughs> the psychology of that world is to have loads of feelings. So the more feelings you have, the more power you have. <laughs> right? or, the more, or the ability to express those, those feelings, yeah? Exactly. So you see what I mean? So there is this, your personal disposition, the feedback loop and the context, and this, this process of cultural psychology and, um, and the collective psychology and, and how it works in that sector. And all of those things influence this, this process of, of, uh, of obsession with power. <laughs> Hmm. It's funny you say that. I was remembering, like, how when I started to work a lot with um, with female colleagues, how I started to feel low rank in in in, in particularly in this, you know, understanding or or self recognition that I lacked the kind of vocabulary and the ability to really be nuanced about what I was feeling and 
compared with women. And then that led me to precisely what you are saying, that actually a lot of our ways of relating and our attitudes emerge from this invisible space, this field, which we call culture or different things, but it's like something, a field, a dynamic, or a set of, of strings of energy fields that are there that shape the way we then act, what, what we see in the end of the day, the way we relate with each other. So it's really interesting that because I think that kind of points us to the direction of paying real, really attention to the patterns, the dynamics, the habitual ways we do things, start to question them and to acknowledge, particularly in a society like we live that is so based on individualism, that part of the things that we think it's our problem and it's our own defects or our own responsibility are also actually much more nuanced in the sense that they are part of an heritage of generations and generations of ways of doing things that shape the way I do today uh, my own actings, my own deeds, uh, doings in the world. And so I, what I'm feeling like, so we talked about, you know, the, the, the role that rank, privilege and power have in, in, you know, in leading to conflicts, how not seeing conflict as an, as a, a tension in the system, like a, a big bang that invites us to deepen our relationships and to evolve, to transform them to a place of more potential. And we talked about godlike kind of dynamics that really both people who idolize others and the people who are idolized uh, create this dynamic together. And one of the things you mentioned that I, re- I want to like, live as a, as a way of, of a segue to close the interview is that m- maybe one of the ways to keep us in check, because I also observed your, your, the way you portray the dynamics that as soon as you get some sort of centrality, the normal, the, the pattern is that you lose more touch with the margins, right? So that, that's a very natural dynamic, let's say. So we need to have ritual ceremonies processes that help us collectively to keep those things in check so that center and margins are never too rigid and too distant that there's more dynamic and tending and then that needs to be done collectively so it's not a responsibility just on the godlike figure or on the on, on the others is like a more like a really how we all this all together is there anything else you'd like to add just before we close the interview, Anna? Um, I mean, I could say so many things, but <laughs> I know. Really, it's such an area, and I, you know, I have a center dedicated. You know, I run a center dedicated to the transformation of human conflict. So it's such a for it's such a I, it's a passion for me uh, to become a student of conflict, right? And to to really enter into the places of tension with an empty mind and the curiosity of a child to really be able to see, feel, sense the way the network is trying to relate and understand itself. So I agree, we need methods, uh, tools, frameworks rituals, group processes, dialogues, to learn to sit and relate and communicate and dance the fires of tension and diversity. And I think there are many methods now dedicated to this, right? And I I work with different facilitation tools and many others do. But I would say that for me... um, uh, I, I think something that helps a lot is to, to, to think about conflict as, um, as an unconditional loving moment, a place that loves. It's like we are part of this quantum network. We are a quantum field of interconnected parts in the universe, right? We are particles that shared an interconnected process of relating. And in mm-hmm. moments like that, conflict is like 
it loves us so much that it wants us to understand each other. Yes, like uh, what causes pain is is those things that matter most to us, right? Yeah. Thank you so much, Chana. It was a lovely. I love the conversation, and I I'm looking forward to have another talk uh, for the third week, and so that you can share some of the bodies of practices you are you are bringing to the world that can support us to deal with these tensions and these difficult situations in a way that's more life affirming, healthy, and regenerative. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this space and, and for just, uh, yeah, just getting to know each other as well. It's been a gift. Thank you.